So Intel's 11th gen is out, kind of. We've seen results that are already floating around the internet and you can probably tell that they're not that desirable. And uh, we've kind of, ASRock has sent over their Tai Chi Z590 motherboard and said, take a look at this thing. And I kind of feel a little bit sorry for ASRock with these upcoming CPUs where the motherboard in this case looks extremely good and performs extremely good, which we're gonna go over the numbers here today, but could it be let down by the CPUs? Well, that will be for you guys to judge, especially with the 11900K review right around the corner. Today though, we're gonna take a look at Z590, the extra features you get, and also what ASRock have done with the Tai Chi motherboard in the sense that they've improved the 14 phase design, especially on the choke frontage. And also they've given a few little extras, especially when it comes to the aesthetic we have got now that turning cogwheel up the top left hand side, but you've also got this beautiful, amazing aesthetic to the point where I don't usually focus too much on aesthetics on motherboards, but what they've done this time around is absolutely gorgeous. So let's roll that intro for you guys, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty details. So let's be straight up with you guys. When it comes to a motherboard, I look at two of the main factors, and that is what's the price and at that price, is it going to work for its intended market? So straight away, this thing is expensive. There's no beating you guys around the bush. It's 430 USD, and at least that's the price I'm seeing on from retailers. And then in Australia, it's 660 Aussie dollars. So it's a premium board. And then you're probably wondering, well, is this going to give me a premium experience? And here's where we're gonna move on to the first most important part with any motherboard, and that is the VRM and the implementation of it. Well, we've got here a 14 phase design from Azeroth. I'll put the details up in terms of the MOSFETs as well as the chokes being used, as well as their 12K Nichicon capacitors and the digital PWM controller. Where the most important part is we did test this with an eight core 16 threaded CPU. <clears throat> Let's just call it a, a a retail sample for all intents and purposes. But out of the box, we managed to score about 206 watts power usage. Now from the wall, this did show us that the power numbers were being pretty accurate, at least the ones provided by Hardware Info 64. And this managed to stress the VRM in a 27 degree ambient environment. This managed to push the VRM up to 75 degrees on the surface temperatures, which for me personally is one of the most important because it gets to see if there's any trickery involved in some of the numbers being reported by the software. And when it came to the software, that was reporting as well to go into the 60 degree region. So this was uh, pretty much a very good board in terms of controlling the um, temperatures on the VRM at least with terms of the MOSFETs. So if you want to overclock now, you will be getting into the 80 degree region. Of course, the CPU will start juicing up even more power, going close to that of 300 watts. Though, here's the thing, if you want to overclock and you want even more cooling, ASRock do include an option for an extra three centimeter fan because there's already one implemented into the heatsink over the VRM, which does weigh in at 245 grams. So in terms of the VRM, the Tai Chi series, ASRock always do a good job of implementing something that is going to work and it's going to work well. Considering our hotter ambient climate here, it did do a very good job. And of course, the noise on those heatsink fans, if you include the two or you just use the one, is gonna be very low. And that's one thing they got right this time around and when they're using these fans is from the get-go, they've got that quiet profile, but still providing a little bit of extra cooling. Though, moving through the rest of the features, what about the onboard audio? And this is a very different design in terms of them using a different Kodak at the rear versus the front. And that is for the rear, they're using the Realtek 1220. And I'll pull up the numbers here for you guys where the crosstalk is still really good as well as the uh, frequency response. But on the front, they're using the ES Sabre 921 1.8 DAC solution. And here is where, if you're a bit of an audio enthusiast, you definitely want to plug your headphones into the front out because you're going to be getting a much better experience. Near that of a perfect solution, and especially for a motherboard, this is very impressive. Even if you want to use something like a Sennheiser HD 600 pair of cans, this is going to give you a great listening experience. 
out of the box. You've also got the Nehemic audio there if you wish to tune things. So the audio experience on both the rear and the front is pretty good, but you definitely want to use the front. And in terms of the mic output, here's where they've done a really good job too, where there was a little bit of noise suppression being used, but it was very minor to the point where, honestly, you could use this for streaming and getting audio across to your viewers and having them have a very good listening experience. Though, what about the PCA 4.0, which is the biggest jump up, especially on Intel's side of things, where AMD already implemented that a while ago, Intel are finally getting onto implementing PCA 4 native with the 11th gen CPUs. And here's where we scored on the M.2 scores, that of in the realm of PCA 4.0 speeds when we used a 4.0 drive. Speeds were very good, very consistent, and the temperatures were also very good too at least with, in terms of the heat sinks, because the PCA 4.0 drives, they do get very hot. So you will want to definitely have a heat sink on them. And here's where we scored 58 degrees maximum whilst doing our test. And then on the surface temperatures, they were lower. However, keep in mind, you will want to use the top port for PCA 4.0 connectivity with the M.2. As well as if you want to get your graphics card in 4.0 mode, then you will want to use the top slot as that's the only PCA 4.0 slot. And that's the X16 slot. What about now memory speeds and also the topology of the memory? I'll put that up on the screen for you guys, but the most important thing is they say it goes up to speeds of 5,000 megahertz on the box. This is gonna be very dependent on how many sticks you're using in relation to the CPU as well, because Intel have admitted that there is a difference in the binning of the chips in terms of their IMC quality as well, not just the core clocks, but also the IMC. And so if you get the 11900K, for example, that's gonna have a gear one that's higher than the 11700K, which will use a gear two, which essentially half the memory uh, core controller clocks to that of the 11900K. Now, here's where we did get our memory and gear two ratio up to 4,400 megahertz across four sticks, which was actually very impressive as this is the highest I've seen on a 32 gig kit here at the studio. Now, in terms of getting to 5,000 megahertz, if you had maybe two eight gigabyte sticks, you could test that out, but I can't validate that claim here personally. But I will say one thing, this board getting up to 4,400 megahertz across four eight gigabyte sticks is quite an impressive feat. The one extra cool detail to mention is that this board will support non-registered ECC memory on DDR4 side. So if you have some of this memory lying around and you wanna use it, you can use it with this board and it will just turn off the ECC portion. Though going through the rear of the board, this is where you've got eight USB ports in total, two of those being 3.2 type A and then two being the type C's that we spoke about before. And then the additional four being just your USB 3.1. And we've got two LAN ports, one of those being a killer 2.5 gigabits per second, the other being an Intel uh, 219V. And then they've also included Wi-Fi 6E as well as Bluetooth 5.2. And on top of that, you get a BIOS flashback button, which does come in handy, especially if you want to update. Well, actually, it's not going to come in too much handy for you guys this time around because uh, the next generation will probably be DDR5 and PCIe 5.0. <laughs> Perhaps it's a good thing if you're updating your BIOS in a thunderstorm. Though the last thing to go over with the rear input output connectivity is ASRock are claiming they've got their patent pending on this new technology for gamers, which separates the mouse packets from the keyboard packets in that one of the packets is going through the USB control, the other through the PCIe, and they're claiming this will give you ever so slightly better latency. And I mean, in a world of mouses now marketing with 8,000 Hertz, I think some people might care about this. I honestly am not going to be really doing anything dedicated towards this because after one millisecond after a thousand hertz it does get extremely negligible in terms of the difference even if you are a top tier pro and the sad thing is about that is i can't even pick it up with my thousand fps camera so good luck picking it up with your eyes though now it's time for the most important thing if you are an rgb lover and that is asrock have done some really good things in terms of aesthetics on this board to the point where I personally think this is the best looking motherboard that has come through here at the studio. They've used some kind of crocodile skin-esque style on the heat sinks, and I gotta say I love it. Of course, being down under here, I love myself a good croc, and what better than crocodile skin on your motherboard? And more importantly, that Tai Chi logo, which on the top left-hand side, they've actually implemented now a turning wheel that relates to, I believe, CPU load. And then of course, you've got that RGB, which you've got the option for addressable 
5 volt RGB or 12 volt RGB and you've got different lighting zones, even lighting zones underneath the board, which you can change within the BIOS itself, which one thing I do love about ASRock boards is that they do include that native BIOS controller, which doesn't interfere with your install of Windows and doesn't add on top of any extra bloatware, which can actually affect your FPS, which if we compare it to other forms of RGB control software, those types of RGB control can affect your FPS this is not going to affect your FPS. So now the final things to go over, we've got eight SATA ports supporting RAID 0, 1, and 5, and 10 on the Intel native controller, and you've got USB 3.2 front outs, and then there's a total of eight PWM fan headers, which are controllable via the BIOS, and you've got the option to auto-tune them from the motherboard if you wish to. And speaking of the BIOS, that is, like always, a good experience, which doesn't need to be changed. ASRock have kind of gone with the same formula now for generations on end, but my opinion is if something works and it works well, then there's no real need to change it. But I wish they would implement the internet flash feature on AMD boards. And since this is an Intel board, you do get that internet flash option. So if you wanna get the latest BIOS, plug in a auto routed connection, and then you can download the latest update on your BIOS with ease without doing anything else. So with all those tests out of the way, it's conclusion time. And what I saw here was a board that passed everything with flying colors. But of course that price tag, that's lingering there. You guys most likely know what you're getting into if you wanna get this board premium board that after all the tests does offer a premium experience. Of course, it's not gonna be for even most people out there. I'd say it's gonna be for a very small amount of people building a high-end rig, but at least if you wanna get the best, then this board is definitely going to deliver that. The whether or not the 11900K or the 11700K is the CPU for you as well, that's another question that will be answered very soon, at least on Tech Air City. So stay tuned for that review. Anyhow guys, with that aside, I hope you enjoyed today's review. If you did, then be sure to smash that like button for us. Also let us know in the comment section below what you think of Z590. Do you think ASRock have done a great job on this board and they've sort of been, maybe, I don't know, put to the test by Intel? Do leave a comment down below. Let us know those thoughts and opinions. And speaking of thoughts and opinions, we got the question of the day here, which comes from Jaden Ford and they ask, hey TYC, do you know if I can fit a BTX case into an ETX case? So I think they're talking about the motherboard and BTX when it comes to BTX is basically the reverse of ATX. Forget the E on there, ATX is just a standard where the board, you'll have the input output in a standard sort of format that's facing the left. BTX is sort of the opposite. So you got the input output going this way and there's just really no way to do it unless you are extremely adventurous in terms of your modding skills and it's just gonna be so much more effort to do it. I actually don't know of any retail BTX cases. If anything, I would just get an open test bed or even maybe something off AliExpress that you got that open frame style look. Though if you do this, you might have to drill some new holes and then put the standoffs in. So that would probably be the path of least resistance and at least having a build that looks somewhat normal. Hope that answers that question. If you guys have stayed this far and you're still watching and you're enjoying that tech yes content, you're not yet subbed yet then just head on over, grab the mouse, left click the sub button, left click on that bell icon and ring it. And I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now, bye.